Good morning. This is Fred Emery with Heartland One Card. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for One Card Transaction Security. This webinar is in listen only mode. So if you have any questions, please go to the GoToWebinar control panel and simply type in the questions that you may have. I will try to answer them throughout the presentation. However, I will allow some time at the end uh, to answer any questions. Unlike our other webinars, this webinar is uh, scheduled for a half an hour. Uh, we should have plenty of time to get through the subject matter, but it's a little more condensed in terms of uh, the subject matter regarding one card transaction security. The webinar is also being recorded. We will post it on our website, usually within a week. It just needs to go to our marketing team who will post it on the website, and you should see it at www.onecard.com. That's the number one card.com within a week's time. So let's get started talking about one card transaction security. In today's session, we'll go over a little bit of a brief introduction to who Heartland is for those who are not aware of uh, Heartland and our uh, business operations and what products we, we supply. We'll then discuss financial transaction security. Uh, meaning standard payment types within the one card system and how you can secure those financial transactions, debit cards, credit cards, and whatnot. We're going to talk about end-to-end -end encryption, tokenization, and EMV, how that plays as part of the one card system and how it can you can utilize those tools to provide secure transactions and talk a little bit more about then general one card transactions using that campus card within the one card system in a secure fashion what pieces are in place within one card to help you secure those transactions uh, so let's get right to it and just a little bit of background if you're not aware of who heartland is uh, heartland is a payment processor primarily our core business is allowing retail locations restaurants and educational institutions to accept credit and debit cards as a form of payment through various terminals and online. We have over 3,000 employees, more than 300,000 merchants, 3,000 of which are colleges and universities. And in 2014, we processed more than 3.3 billion transactions and $122 billion in volume. We are the fifth largest payment processor in North America, and we're able to Utilize that knowledge within the one card system to help securely process one card transactions as well as the standard debit and credit cards that you may all wish to process throughout your one card system as a form of payment. Now we have seen of, of recent days, more recently than um, in the past, that the number of pay points for standard credit card and debit cards is increasing on campus. Uh, more campuses are moving beyond just the web-based product for deposit and are now looking to accept credit cards in their vending machines and laundry in the point of sale terminals for direct deposits in an administrative terminal. Um, students are used to having multiple card types in their wallets. Um, and they want to utilize them on a daily basis in addition to their one card. So the number of pay points is generally increasing on uh, a college campus. So what we see, of course, is that campuses are becoming more concerned about security with those transactions. How do you secure those debit and credit card transactions as part of the one card system? And how do you keep your one card transactions secure as well? Another concern, of course, is the payment card industry and payment application data security standards. How does the campus keep on top of the regulations and minimize their liability and scope as it applies to accepting these payment types within their systems throughout campus? That is a, definitely a concern for, for college administrators that we hear as we talk to you all and uh, really try to help you stay on top of those regulations. And of course, many people have been coming to us to talk about EMV. EMV stands for Europay MasterCard Visa, and it's those chip-based cards. There is a change that's coming in October of this year 
regarding EMV. And a lot of campuses are in the process of trying to get ready and ramp up for acceptance of the EMV cards in addition to the standard magnetic stripe credit and debit cards in their locations. Now, one of the reasons, of course, that we want to stay on top of security and provide a secure environment for accepting all card types is due to data breaches. Um, between 2005 and 2013, more than 551 data breaches were reported on college and university campuses. This is quite a large number. Some of them were involving card transactions, debit and credit card transactions, but a good number of those also involved just straight up database hacks to get personal information such as name and address, social security number, birth dates, and what have you. So there were a large amount of data breaches during that period of time. And this is a concern for, for campuses. And one reason why we work to provide that secure environment for your transactions. Now, Lucian has averaged or um, calculated that in each data breach, there's an average number of 27,509 records that were exposed per those breaches at an estimated cost of $142 per exposed record. That's more than $4 million per breach. So that's quite a bit of money. And another reason why we look to secure those transactions on your campus, minimize the ability for you to be at risk while you're processing transactions through your one card system provide you with an environment where you do not have that risk or we minimize and help you reduce the liability for an average of $4 million per breach. Now, one of the, way, the ways we do this is at Heartland is pro providing a three-tiered solution called Heartland Secure, which helps you to secure your transactions. Now, I'm gonna use Heartland Secure as, as an example. I know there's a number of folks on from Canada. Um, Heartland Secure provides a three-tiered solution to provide secure transactions. However, for the folks up in Canada, talk to your processors that you use. Let's say Chase Payment Tech. I know that many of our Canadian clients use Chase Payment Tech up in Canada and talk to them about the use and acceptance of Interact with pin pads um, and the other features that you're going to see here as part of Heartland Secure. I'll bring it back to light towards the end of, of the session and remind you about these three levels, these three tiers, three pieces of securing the transactions and what you should also bring up to your processors uh, in the US and in Canada to see if they can provide this for you. So you're in the uh, have the best of breed security within your system for accepting standard payment types. So let's delve a little bit into Heartland Secure and use that as an example. I don't think you want to watch it twice. Sorry about that. <laughs> it was so good once, you had to see it again. Um, just that beginning part there. So Heartland Secure will provide you with a three-tiered approach, one being end-to-end -end encryption, one would be tokenization, and the third would be EMV, those chip-based cards. So let's look at all three of these areas and see how they can help you. And we're also going to talk a little bit about uh, more in depth about EMV and the EMV liability shift that's coming up in October. So 
Traditionally, card data when using a magnetic stripe card reader has been in the clear. It's not been encrypted. So you can see here, this is an example of data that would be in, encoded on the back of a magnetic stripe card. So the data is in clear text. The card number, the expiration date, the cardholder name, discretionary data um, is all in clear text. And that's standard that many locations will use now with magnetic stripe readers, that it's just not encrypted and it's in the clear. There's not much security there. If you read a magnetic stripe off of a card with a standard reader, which many of you probably have in your offices for um, encoding cards, you'll see the, the, the complete data that's on a magnetic stripe. So what encryption does, an E3 encryption, end-to-end -end encryption, is that it encrypts all that data at the point for the transaction at the point that the magnetic stripe is read through a tamper-resistant security module in the read head. So it encrypts that data and transmit it, transmit it, transmits it end-to-end -end in an encrypted format. It obfuscates track one card number data. Um, it'll leave the name clear so that the name can be printed on receipts. Many payment processor receipts will have the person's name on it but it will obfuscate then all the discretionary data and provide encryption within this. So it is totally encrypted and um, that encryption block is sent in the transmission so that at the other end, when it gets to the processor, it can, um, such as Heartland, it can decrypt that data. So having end-to-end -end encryption, some processors will call it point-to-point -point encryption. Heartland is E3 end-to-end -end encryption data right from the magnetic stripe reader. So that is one piece to the puzzle to encrypt that data and provide that secure transaction. Second piece is EMV, the move to chip-based cards. Now our friends up in Canada are way ahead of us here in the US and our friends over in Europe are way ahead of us in the US with chip-based cards. Uh, Canada uses Interac cards, um, for, for their, their debit accounts and their chip-based cards, chip plus PIN, which um, definitely reduces the liability and reduces the chance of, uh, of fraud because it is, um, there's dual authentication there with the PIN, but it's not open on a magnetic stripe. The chip is uh, much more secure. So EMV is, um, a standard governing the interoperability of chip cards and payment devices. Again, EMV stands for Europay, MasterCard, and Visa. It's a global interoper interoperability and improved card security. Uh, it's not a government or card brand mandate for merchants or card holders. It's a, um, how should I say, it's a suggestion or a movement to provide a more secure environment. And um, if you're a card issuer, your bank is pro providing you with an EMV card, it will also include a magnetic stripe. So if there are terminals that do not have um, a chip-based reader, they can still read the magnetic stripe. So we're seeing this, the change here in the US to move to these chip-based cards to provide a more secure environment and secure transaction. Now, in October of 2015, there's going to be a shift related to liability of card acceptance at merchant locations. Now, if you as a campus accept credit cards and you point of sale terminals, um, for face-to-face -face transactions, not meaning not online transactions, you would be considered a merchant. So currently in the U.S. here we have MagStripe and MagStripe terminals. With this current setup, the issuer of the card is liable for any counterfeit card use or fraud on the card side. Now I'm not talking about breaches or hacks to the system necessarily, but actual counterfeit card and fraud, um, that's on the issuer's side. Now, come October of this year, if it's a MagStripe card with a MagStripe terminal, it's still the issuer's liability. 
if it's a MagStripe card with a terminal that also can accept the chip, the EMV chip, it's still the issuer's liability. If a person comes in with a chip card and the merchant only has a MagStripe terminal, they're not able to accept a chip-based card, that's when the liability shifts to the, shifts to the merchant and it becomes the merchant's liability for those transactions. Meaning, um, if let's say a counterfeit card was used in a dining location and uh, that transaction amounted to $5, the merchant would have liability for that $5 when the transaction was um, brought up from the card holder that they didn't use that card, that it was a, a fraudulent transaction. The shift would be to the merchant instead of the issuer at that point because you didn't have the updated technology to accept that chip card. Now, of course, if you have a chip card and there is a chip terminal at the location, the liability is back onto the issuer. So there's that one piece there where there's a chip card presented with a MagStripe only terminal where the merchant has some liability. Uh, so to summarize, liability for fraud shifts to the merchant when a counterfeit chip card is used at a MagStripe terminal after October of 2015. Now the shift with the liability for EMV is not a mandate or required. It's the merchant choice to implement. It's just a uh, shift in the industry to provide a more secure environment, which is a great thing. Uh, so EMV is not protection against all chargebacks, meaning if my card was used and I said, hey, you know, that wasn't me. I didn't use it. That was a fraud. That's considered a chargeback against, um, against that transaction. The liability shift is for counterfeit and lost or stolen only. Um, EMV also does not necessarily secure the cardholder data. EMV does not protect or encrypt card numbers. That comes within the other pieces. The, the um, end-to-end -end encryption, and the third piece that we'll get to in a minute called tokenization. And EMV protects against fraud, whereas PCI focuses on security of sensitive data. So you as a campus, even when you move to EMV, still have to have a concentration on the payment card industry regulations and make, making sure that you're focused on the security of sensitive data. The third part is tokenization. Now what that this means is that tokenization and end-to-end -end encryption work together to make an EMV transaction secure. The card transaction, once it's encrypted and is sent over, is not clear card data. What is sent back is a token from the processor, so the terminal and the point of sale system is not getting back that card data. They're just getting back a token or a reference type number with that um, transaction authorization or decline. Uh, so they're not getting back any of that card data uh, from for future transactions to have on file. It's just a reference number uh, to perform a post-sale transaction so such as a void or a refund. It removes any direct reference to the card number by substituting the consumer's card number with the token. Um, so that's the third part. You encrypt the transaction, uh, use a chip card to provide additional security, and have a token in place of that card data coming back from the processor. So here's the process as a whole. Uh, the consumer credit card is utilized. Here we see an EMV transaction. That chip card is being used. Encrypted card data is sent. The secure transaction is processed at the processor, and a token is assigned, and the token is returned to the terminal. So the card data is not sent back um, and transmitted. Obviously, you'd have that encryption built into that card transaction from the terminal to the processor. Now, Heartland does offer a breach warranty, which is uh, pretty unique in the industry. Um, we're very confident in our solution. So we offer an unprecedented breach warranty to all merchants who are Heartland secure, utilizing those three levels, those three tiers of um, transaction security. 
the end-to-end -end encryption, E3, tokenization, and EMV. So as long as they're processing with Heartland, this is at no additional cost, and it's a complete warranty for any breach to these, the transaction system here. Now, another thing that you can do as a campus to provide a more secure transaction environment is move to an out-of-scope configuration. Now, when you look at this top diagram here, what you'll see is that a card is accepted through a card reader or, or a payment terminal, which transmits the data through the POS to the processor. This is typical of many POS systems uh, to date where you'll read the card, it'll go through the POS over the network to uh, the processor. What an out of scope configuration does is it doesn't allow the card to process within the point of sale terminal. It's a separate terminal that is semi integrated with the POS. It's connected to exchange some base data, but no card data. So the cashier would ring up the transaction, let's say it was a $6 lunch, it would then say, hey, terminal, uh, somebody here wants to pay by credit card with $6. The terminal then would accept the card, EMV, Magstripe, you can even do mobile transactions, and the terminal would communicate to the processor. Now, your terminal could be on a whole separate network, so you can move your one card point of sale system out of scope of these transactions and, and really minimize that uh, the scope and liability of those transactions. The terminal can communicate over a separate network or other means, um, maybe cellular, maybe dial-up, or a, a, a virtual LAN for a VLAN for specific to those terminals to your processor, to Heartland as an example, and process that transaction. When the authorization comes back, that token comes back, it gets the decline or fail, and it simply tells the POS, yep, the transaction is good, we're all set, great, ready to move on. And uh, that really minimizes the scope and pulls that POS into an out-of-scope configuration. Now, in order to continue providing proper security within the system, you do need to be concerned with PCI standards. So please build and maintain a secure na network. Install and maintain firewall configurations uh, to protect that data. Um, do not store any cardholder data and encrypt all cardholder data that's transmitted. Uh, maintain a vulnerability management program where you're using and regularly updating antivirus software and maintain secure systems and applications, and implement strong access control measures. Now, many campuses will have their network on campus and their servers. Um, place access control on your campus, physical access control, to limit how someone can get to these servers and to your network, and restrict physical access to card data as a whole. Um, Make sure you're using unique logins for each person that's accessing your computer system. Separate out your network so that those that are processing credit cards are separated from other systems so that there isn't the possibility for connection to that data. Regularly monitor and test your networks. Track and monitor on access to your networks and test your security systems. And maintain an information security policy that addresses all this with your personnel. Let them know what they're supposed to do and not supposed to do with accepting credit cards and really what the, the best practices are. Now, we do have a document around one card which talks about uh, PADSS and PCI security and making sure that uh, you are doing these best practices. Just let any of your regional sales managers or support team members know, any of the Heartland support team members know, and we can provide you with this document and assist you as needed. Just let us know and we're, we're happy to talk to you about that. Now, one card is a validated payment application, meaning that we've undergone um, audits from third-party providers to make sure our transactions are secure and we're meeting the standards for PADSS. And this is the complete one card system. 
soup to nuts. All aspects of the software have been evaluated and um, have gone through the necessary security changes within one card, as well as um, a whole battery of tests against the transactions. So this is one thing within one card that also can help you provide secure transactions. Utilizing a campus card system that is a validated payment application where the provider has developed the pieces embedded into it and goes through the trouble of continuously updating and getting system audits from third party um, providers. Now, when looking at one card transactions, there's a couple of best practices to keep in mind. For your ID number, and this might seem simple, but some folks might think of it, not think of it. Do not use credit card or social security numbers as your ID number. That can open you up to more liability and a possible um, transaction breaches or what have you. Use generated ID numbers or ISO numbers instead of those. And of course, use a card issuance or suffix um, when you Replace a card, make sure that as part of the encoding on the card, that the card issuance or suffix is changed automatically, or if you're using a contactless card, that um, the encoding on that MyFair card, for example, is altered, or the um, PROX or I-Class number is totally changed on that account. Um, one card does provide encrypted transactions, um, depending upon the terminal, we're either using AES-256 or Blowfish. So you do have encryption built into your transactions automatically for one card. Limit access to who can get to the one card system and what functions they have through the system access privileges. Make sure that someone who doesn't need to see certain card data and transaction information or have access to altering terminals, that they don't have that access. Limit their access within the system. One card will force password changes on a um, preset amount of time. That's needed for maintaining our validated payment application uh, status. And obviously separate your network, use VLANs, so that your one card transactions can be separated from your credit cards if you're using an out of scope configuration, or the complete system doesn't touch upon other systems on your campus um, to keep those transactions secure. It would help limit who has access then to all those transactions flowing over your network. So that um, basically is the, the, the presentation and what we want to discuss with you regarding securing financial transactions. Now I mentioned um, I would bring back up the pieces for Canada. Now Canada our folks up in Canada, talk to your processors about encrypted transactions. Uh, you can, of course, separate out your transactions and move to an out-of-scope configuration and have end-to-end -end encryption with the various providers up there. Um, on our POS stealth, a number of campuses are using uh, Interact cards with a uh, VX820 Duet reader. Um, I think the University of Alberta is using these, a couple of others as well, and some are using Interact Online. So that's something to look at if you're up in Canada and you are not taking advantage of those transactions, uh, those pieces of transaction security. Now, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to type those questions in right here in the questions area of the GoToWebinar control panel. You, of course, can always email me. You should be seeing my email on your screen. Um, as well as our website and phone, phone number. One co uh, question that came up is, can I com comment on TAP credit debit cards in this process? Are they secure? Now, the TAP ones are, are, are basically contactless transactions. Now, the there is encryption that's built in to the cards, the card brands have specific encryption that is part of the contactless chip information that's stored. So those those are encrypted and the reader will read it and transmit accordingly. Um, the chip, I the contact chip in regards to credit card transactions, I think it might be slightly more secure. But I mean, 
it from 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 my knowledge, it's not really much of a difference. I mean, you can tap those contactless cards, those contactless credit and debit cards, and process in a secure fashion. There is encryption that's built in to that um, transaction process. Um, a question came in, does this process require Heartland payment systems to be the processor? On this Heartland Secure, where we have the Heartland E3, and that's a brand of this three-tiered approach, Heartland E3, Heartland Tokenization, and the EMV, that refers directly to a Heartland product called Heartland Secure. There are other processors that do offer pieces of that or um, similar type products that might fluctuate a little bit. So if you would like to communicate with your processor, I would ask them if you're using someone other than Heartland, ask them what they do in regards to tokenization, EMV, and um, end-to-end encryption. So, uh, well, one question that came in, can the uh, encrypting magnetic stripe reader wedge be used to encode campus cards? And if so, will the cards be readable by the standard POS card readers we currently use, DCT3 terminals, et cetera? The encrypting wedge um, that will be available with the point of sale system. We know when a, one card is being read and a credit card is being read, and we can tell the difference. So the one cards would not be encrypted in the same manner as the credit card. So you can use the same reader um, for those transactions. And that are, are, is all the questions that I see on um, in the questions area right now. So I do thank you. If you have any other questions that pop up, feel free to um, to email me or give me a call or reach out to your regional sales representative and they could always funnel those questions over to me and we'll be able to answer them uh, fully for you. Thank you very much. This is being recorded as I mentioned and will appear on our website Within the next uh, within the next week, should be the next couple of days. Thank you very much.